John Powell. I'm here on All Access Hollywood. No, that's not right. <laughs> we can change All it. All Access. <laughs> um, and we're talking exclusively and only about poodles. <laughs> John, thank you so much uh, for inviting me back here to your studio. So great to talk again. Pleasure. <laughs> So last time we did an interview, so if anyone is listening, go back and watch our, we did a nice big long interview about a lot of your individual projects and uh, your background and history. Um, but let's just kind of jump into it. Um, so it's the year 2018, looking back at your entire career um, up to now, kind of how has the industry changed, kind of whether it's people or the business or the, the art itself, how's it changed kind of in, in the course of your career that you've seen? Um. Well, there, there's some great developments, I think some bad developments things at least I don't like but are probably okay um, I think you know technology's changed yeah so everybody now has to do a demo except yeah. for John Williams <laughs> and then if he needs to do a, a demo we, he hires an orchestra which is great <laughs> yeah. um, the rest of us have to sweat at the computer <laughs> um, let's see what else has happened obviously Avid has taken over so much that the idea of any film being locked is unheard of now I mean, right. of 57 films, I've only ever had one that didn't change um, while I was writing it. Wow. A lot. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of difficult. It's very hard to invest then. You know, you think, oh, I'm going to write this scene and then they're going to change it. Should I really bother? Yeah. Um, I think musically, people have become uh, perhaps more inclined to listen to the temp. I mean, mm -hmm. That's dangerous because you can really hear it. I mean, it's very useful for composers. I've said this before. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It makes it an easy job, but you know, when you just can sort of go through and spot all the movies that were tempted into the film. <laughs> I mean, I guess I started noticing that with Born when you, when you really start right. hearing your own stuff. Until then, maybe I hadn't noticed it as much because it wasn't my material. Yeah, yeah. It's probably maybe constant. it was just as true. <laughs> um, so, and there's been a there has been a sort of a simplification of of film music um, there's a there's a reason for that simplification I, in terms as a good thing or a bad thing I wouldn't I think it's a okay thing for filmmakers uh -huh. um, as a somebody who likes music I don't really like it mm -hmm. because I find it a bit basic yeah too basic um, you know I'm a big fan of minimalism and minimalism yeah. is not is that simple yeah um, I, I mean simplistic I should say right right <laughs> um, you know it's a lot of film music which works extremely well because it sounds kind of like the accompaniment to a tune but doesn't have a tune yeah um, and obviously that works really well especially when you've got lots of dialogue right um, but it does mean that I would never want to put any of that music on and listen to it it really is background music it's it is become it's become people doing an impression of music mm -hmm. um, you know and I've been responsible for that. I mean, I think Bourne was very minimalistic, oh, deliberately sure. so. Yeah. Uh, but I was trying to imbue it with some, with what I liked of minimalistic music, um, true minimalist music, and mm -hmm. the and the function and the structure of of it. And I was trying to imbue it with beats that, that I loved from you know Massive Attack and Bjork and things. Yeah. So I I was hoping that it would be interesting music to listen to. I know people didn't like it at first and. Uh, because it was very non-orchestral, but it's now become the problem with any any kind of simple music, simplistic music is it's very easy to do. Yeah. And the people who do it well, I, put, I think everybody else that comes along and and listens to that, they think, oh, well, I could do that. And it's true, you could do that, but yeah. then it comes to the qu the, qu the question of quality. Um, I'd say you know, Claire de Lune is a simple piece of music uh, but it's one of the most it's probably the most sophisticated piece of music I've ever written yeah yeah um and there's very few people actually none who, who have ever written anything quite as beautiful in that particular way um but it doesn't mean that you can come along and you can just flounce around on the piano yeah and make a piece of music that has the same qualities right. as that so i don't know but our, our job as composers for film is to sort of is to grease the wheels of the story and whatever really needs to happen, I guess, that's fine. <laughs> um, so, you know, being a composer, part of it is writing music for film and, and accompanying the, the picture. Um, part of it is also, I think, being 
a businessman and, and having to ne negotiate and navigate the waters of this industry as a business. So if you had to give a percentage, what percentage of your job is artistic creativity and what percentage is business? Well, I would say 10% of my time is sent, spent writing the music and 90% of the time is keeping everybody calm. <laughs> Um, <laughs> including myself, <Right. laughs> uh, but you know that depends on the filmmakers, and some, yeah. some are better than others. It, it depends it really on certain films. Right, there's a, there's true. A, yeah. You can be really almost exclusively just being really creative with mm -hmm. the filmmakers, and other times you really have to be careful how you manage manage everybody's expectations mm -hmm. and their their needs. Yeah, what they need versus what the film needs. Right. Absolutely. Um, so as you've you know progressed in your career, has your perspective changed at all in terms of, I guess, just your outlook on life as you've grown older and experienced more? Do you think you've become a better storyteller? Do you think that age allows you to experience more things and make you better adapt at like channeling emotions? Do you channel life into your work? I mean, kind of stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, I. I always started I started out making music to try and channel my own emotions into yeah. it. Um, for film, obviously, you're then trying to find a sort of a similar or identical emotion to the emotion that the right. characters are. Having. Right. So you look into your own life. So the older you get, the more experiences you have, the more life you have. Mm -hmm. In theory, you should get better at. It. Right. Um, the difficulty for me is staying interested in it. Uh, I'm not very good at repeating myself exactly. I mm -hmm. get kind of a bit bored, but. Um, and you know the requirements of of certain types of music mean that it really doesn't interest me in doing it ever, some ever again, mm -hmm. and some I'll always love to do. Yeah, uh, it just depends on the types of films and what the type of story that they're telling is. And uh, I mean, maybe one day I'll step outside that, but I just have a natural instinct for certain things, and perhaps a natural bias against other things and as I've grown older I've just decided that there's I'm okay with that that's, yeah, that's yeah. all right I'm still in, and, and obviously at the same time with that I'm developing I'm trying to develop out of cinema um, you know my chops as a writer right uh, because I think that's probably useful anyway even for my business inside mm -hmm. working for films so when you're I mean when you're writing for film you're your main source of inspiration is on the screen in front of you. But when you're writing uh, a concert piece, or say, like for uh, your piece of Prussian Requiem, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that, there was an idea, of course, behind it, World War One. And um, but where, I mean, where there's no images. I guess where are you pulling the music out of? Out of um, my ass. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, all music comes from every single piece of music I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. and don't let any composer mm -hmm. tell you that it's divine. <laughs> uh, that they're writing anything, that they're inventing anything. Right. Nothing is is invented. It's everything that's come before that you've ever heard mm -hmm. uh, is what you are utilizing to try and tell your own, to communicate your own way. Mm. Um, so I, I'm on, you know, films and the story is there for me. I, yeah. I found that was interesting doing the Prussian Requiem and that I had to. I couldn't really start until I had my own story. So I, I, I did work at that a lot and, and, and found an interesting version of what fascinated me about the First World War, the, the, right. you know, the, the uh, complex destruction of the 20th century. I felt, once I looked at it and studied some very interesting writers' books, an uh, amazing book called The Guns of August by mm. Bar Barbara Tuckman. Um, about how really it all came, I feel it all came down to, you know, one man having a hissy fit uh, <laughs> on the night of, you know, the, the penultimate night of peace. <laughs> right. And making sure that things moved ahead simply because he wanted it. Yeah. He wanted it to happen because he felt it was, he'd worked too hard on the plan and he didn't want to change the plan. And he'd been looking forward to this. And all the kind of human, terrible human reasons, when you look at it yeah. in that perspective, that we're all capable of, whether we're three years old or, you know, or 76 years old and sitting in the White House. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's the same instinct, yeah. and it's a very human instinct. Mm -hmm. uh, I want, um, and it can bring us into disaster, and that was really, I think, the prime example of it. Yeah, absolutely, and I always, I always find it 
uh, great that you know you're you're a self-proclaimed like pacifist and you're examining you know big part of war war is you know a huge part of humanity and everything so I thought that was just your seeing your take on that was interesting so yeah. well I, I'm I'm the pacifist who got stuck on the Second World War it's mm -hmm. very hard to be a pacifist about the Second World War you can't sit back and go no nobody should have fought that. yeah I mean it was a madness that had been right but I, I felt it the Second World War I, the only way I could look at it was to look at the First World War and realize that it was an ex, it was really an extension of that and mm -hmm. the destruction of of um, of Germany uh, of, of actually Prussia Prussia was basically wiped off the face of the earth in the sense of politically geopolitically mm -hmm. in the First World War because it was the it was where these the, the 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 aggressors as we see them came from and really they were just the same as everybody else in Europe and they were and that's why I like the idea of just blaming it on one person. <laughs> It's not really one person. He represents yeah. all of us. I right. feel. Um, but um, the circumstances under which you know the Second World, ha World War happened, you know, you cannot defend them. You can't defend it as a pacifist. Yeah. In, in the you know, especially as a Jew, you know, <laughs> it's 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 too difficult to explain. And so the First World War really basically ground Germany into the into the dust and and they stomped on their economy and and they pushed a they pushed a a proud a proud country mm -hmm. into such a corner yeah that you've got to understand now that it's quite and it's very interesting the second the end of the second world war when you look at what happened to Germany and Japan then they had so, so much more um of a successful outcome to the end of hostilities if you think about it yeah yeah you know, everybody's economy in those two countries um boomed uh, you know eventually and uh, and and has created actually two very peaceful countries right yeah um <laughs> so they what they did wrong at the end of the first world war is clearly they learned from the end of the second world war and it's it's heartening to see that that realization going on and it was not easy i'm sure to to achieve that kind yeah. of that peace at the end of the, the the Second World War. I mean, obviously, we didn't because we went immediately into a Cold War. But um, you could see that that the the mistakes at the end of the First World War are what damaged our society in the whole of the the, the 20th century, and we're still we're still suffering from these things. Absolutely, now. absolutely. Um, well, talking more about uh, inspiration, uh, you know, if you work on a film that you're really passionate about and you find something to connect with. Um, inspiration might come easier than say you work on something that you could give two shits about you know i'm sure you've encountered films like that you don't have to name any film in your career but where it's like all right maybe the movie's not good maybe like so if you're working on something like that and you have a job to do where do you start looking to pull inspiration from or pull emotion from if you're not feeling it i, I guess from the picture it, it's a hard one and I, and I feel like um it's important to understand that i I can trick myself into when people ask me if the, is the film good or bad. Yeah. After I finished it, I really don't have any ideas because whichever way it was when I that I knew at the beginning of the film, I I, I would never have been able to get through it unless I told myself that it was great. Yeah. And un, and tried to understand everything within it and and uh, and and behave in a in an empathetic way towards all the characters that I needed to and and get emotionally into the center right, of the film. Right. So you are tricking yourself, you're acting, you're pretending, as it were. But it's Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so let's rewind back a little bit and kind of look at kind of your early work. Um, when you go back and... Do you, do you ever listen to your old work? Do you ever, like... Um, not really, no, unless, unless it's accidentally on the TV I might hear some, or if there's something I'm thinking about, did I... Have I already written this tune? Yeah, <laughs> I might go back and check. <laughs> when you listen to your old work, do you recognize yourself in that in that music? Like, oh, that's me from you know whatever fifteen years ago, or is it like, or it's like, oh, that's exactly how I would write it today? Or do you see it as a different composer or a different person in that music? So some some of it sounds exactly like how I do it, and I yeah. But I'm always struck by wondering how I did it. Sometimes <laughs> you know, I do, I do have to go back sometimes and listen to things to persuade myself that I can do this. Um, and then there are other times you listen to it and you sort of forget because mm -hmm. sometimes it gets written so fast yeah it's like you know the stuff just has to come out real quick and you you know and you forget but <laughs> I must say I mean and this is this is the 
the terrible thing to admit, really, is that I generally always listen to my own music, and even if I don't know it's mine for a minute, I'm attracted to it. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely hear it and go, ooh, I don't like <laughs> yeah, that that's, harmony. Or, you know. That's a good so, thing. So that's just my own preference, I yeah. guess, in it. Well, that's good to, do you, I mean, you, you talk about persuading yourself to do things. Do you have moments of doubt still? Like, do you ever sit there and go, like, fuck, I can't do this? Like, Oh, of course, all the time. All the time? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's, it's a, it's a massive kind of amount of work that you look at yeah. at the beginning and, and very hard to know how to, if you'll get it done, how to get it done, how to get it done on time. Um, and that, that fear can be crippling sometimes. And so just going back and going, okay, well, hang on a minute. I'm just looking back. I did a film like this. Yeah. You know, and oh, I did another one. I did another one. I did another one. Okay. I'm, I probably will be able to do this. So it's just, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, you, I think you've managed to be able to do it, especially since you survived. You're sitting here alive after uh, a Star Wars film, so <laughs> yes, this was this was the one that I really wasn't sure. I mean, really? you know, I was very nervous about. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But um, <laughs> so some of your uh, early uh, credits on IMDb, um, you had a series called Stay Lucky, where it yeah. looks like you. I think you came in later, and took over from someone else, or was yeah, it? I think so. So yeah. was that kind of your first big uh, like screen credit? Well, it was a TV series. TV series, yeah. yeah. It was great to do. Um, yeah, I think I took over. And I think I ended that series. Yeah. I ended, the only TV I did, I always ended the series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it says something about me. Um, it sounded too desperate. <laughs> but that was like, that was pre-media ventures and everything, right? So yeah, was, that was in London, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. then, uh, I mean, you had, other sh you had another series, like High Incident, I think. Which, that was here, yeah. That was here. Yeah, Jeff Rona worked on that with yeah. you. And um, yeah. but going back to this kind of early media venture years, was it a... Uh, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's different than how it is now with remote control, but it, was it a competitive environment, like as a young composer there working, or was it more like there's enough pie to go around, everyone's learning? No, I think it was very competitive, really, mm -hmm. and it and it needed to be. Um, yeah. You know, and I often wonder if I jumped the queue a bit because I, I I was pretty effective and efficient in getting you know a film yeah. having, having arrived here, but I did I did hold back in London a little while after Hans had invited me. I, I did wait. I wanted to kind of get my chops up, mm -hmm. and um, I knew there was stuff I wanted to work on. Just my, you know, I've always said this to students as well. You know, you have to realize you've got to become virtuosic on the, mm. on the computer. Yeah. You have to be really fast and efficient, and you cannot be sitting around just struggling with the the technology of it. You have to get over that so that you can get the writing to be fluid. Yeah, uh, and there's just too high a standard. Everybody can do it now. Um, so I think I, I felt I needed to get my chops up. Right. And uh, so I paused a little bit before I came, and then when I came, I really dug in. And, and, uh, and yeah, you could see there was lots of composers, really good composers there. Yeah. Um, and it's not just about, you know, it isn't just about being musical, and it isn't just about being a composer. It's about being smart, um, making the right sort of choices. And mm -hmm. I chose very specifically how to write and who would listen to it. And making sure that really Hans was, you know, gonna pick me out yeah. <laughs> from the all the other kids. Right. I mean, when you're writing in the kind of that environment, because I think there's a, a, a score that I really love, um, Chill Factor, um, that you did with Hans. But there was a lot of people on that oh, too. Everybody was. Everyone was that. Everyone was that. Yeah, so like yeah. when something like that happens, and you get like five, six people working on that, like, uh, but, but your name is on the on the movie. I mean, what's the dynamic? What's the working dynamic there with everyone else? It was probably. They were probably all thinking, why the fuck is his name on there <laughs> with Hans? Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's true. And so they probably work hard on things, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, Harry and I used to have this dynamic where Hans would, he'd, he'd come in and he'd go, you should come in and listen to something Harry's doing. So I'd wander <laughs> over to Harry's room with Hans and we'd sit and then he'd go, Harry, can you play that cue? And Harry would play it for me and, and I'd be realising, fuck, I know what Hans is saying, which is, this is good. Yeah. You need to fucking step up, dude. <laughs> so I'd then go back and I'd, I'd, I'd work harder. And, and there's the same. I saw Harry come in a few times and, and what are you working on? And, and I'd play him things like that. And he'd just stomp out. <laughs> <laughs> you know. but, uh, but most of the time, I mean, most of the time we, we love working together. It w But, you know, it, the truth was, it's, you know, he was very good. Yeah, and but I, it was I like, it was, it was a, uh, because I interviewed him too, and we talked about it, but it was, 
you guys, it wasn't like a, it was like almost, was it, what it, we called it a shotgun wedding? Was it kind of you put together when you would co-compose? Like yeah. ants, that was Hans Absolutely. saying you two worked no, together. No, it wasn't Hans. Hans oh, no. wanted oh, somebody sorry. else. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it was Jeffrey Katzenberg. Katzenberg. Well, this is the story Hans tells, I don't know about you. Okay. Know, being modest. But he said, no, he said, I didn't want the two of you. Jeffrey wants the two of you because we'd both worked on Prince of Egypt. Yes, yeah. Different, I'd worked on the songs and Harry had worked on the school with Hans. Mm-hmm. So he got to know us. I said, why don't you put these two together? And I think it was it was almost like what, the fun of watching a cockfight, possibly. Uh, maybe that's what Jeffrey was thinking, and Hans thought, "Oh yeah, this is going to be really fun." Um, so, so that's how we ended up together. Yeah. And but it was a, it was such a great opportunity. I think yeah. we were both smart enough to know, look, whatever our differences are, I respected him and he respected me, and yeah. we figured it out. You know. And you continued. I mean, you did a couple of scores together. I yes, mean, yeah. love. I I always work with Harry. Anytime yeah. he wants to, I'll work with Harry because it's 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 fun. It's it's a, such a different experience. And so a lot of people don't understand about writing with another composer. It's a you know why would you write with another composer? How? Would you yeah. Write with it? But songwriters do it. You know, True, in yeah. pop music, people do it all the time. I mean, what's wrong with being? you know, slightly stronger on one thing, you know, so you've got a drummer and you've got a guitarist. They can write together. It doesn't mean that, you know, the guitarist can do everything. Yeah, he yeah, could yeah. use a drum machine or I could get in another guitarist. But but it's fun sometimes to, to be with another musician. I mean, that's what composers are, first of all, is we are musicians. Right. I mean, I'm not a good one, but I'm, you know, <laughs> and Harry's a, a very good piano player and obviously he's, he's, he's a, a superb singer, you know. Um, I've got a different background from him, but he is... He comes from a, you know, church music more than I do, but and yet he's totally much more into sort of EDM and yeah. and synths than me. It would appear. And um, <laughs> I mean, his Tony Scott stuff is amazing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, absolutely. You you ne- you never thought it from his background, right? So. And he, I think he said he didn't touch a computer till he, I think, moved, yeah. started working with Hans and, and all yeah. that stuff. So I mean, then he became. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so fast forwarding, but you, you did mention uh, producing songs. Um, and which you've done quite a bit in your career. I mean, stuff on Happy Feet and, and Rio. So when you are working on a song, say it's something like a, a popular song like uh, Happy Feet, which was kind of redoing a bunch of really famous songs, um, what's the process on that to make it part of the fabric of, of the whole movie? Well, Are you kind of just, re- just tuning it to your sounds? Are you trying to make it fit? Or are you like stuffing it kind of in, into place? I mean, what's the process there? The funny thing was that really when I came out of music college, I, I thought I wanted to be a record producer. Mm-hmm. And then I discovered that I, I just didn't have the patience for it and I didn't like other people's music. You know, because you don't get to work on on great songs at the beginning. You get to yeah. work on shitty bands who can't play and, <laughs> or, you know, who are brilliant, but you don't quite, I didn't quite understand it. Mm. So, the, you know, I, I was too much of a control freak, I think. Um, I wasn't mature enough to really be a record producer. So when I got into films and then these things came up of doing arrangements of songs, I started to enjoy that because I'd I'd always loved that side of things. Um, But the difference was I didn't have to ever make the music work for uh, the music listening audience, as it were. Yeah. Um, I I only ever had to help it tell the story. So I think that's what on Happy Feet I was always doing is does this... You know, it was my role to make sure I could bend and twist the song mm-hmm. to to the value of the story at that particular moment. And if I couldn't, if I would break it, then we would we would mm. see, okay, this song isn't going to work. You know, and the lyrical value, the the tempo value yeah. at that particular moment in this in the film, the melodic value, the emotional value of doing it fast or slow or exactly as it was was so interesting it was it was a it was an in, really in, a, a great film to do that one I, I did love that and it was it was a real puzzle to put together of i course. can imagine you know, yeah it took three years yeah so. i mean and um were there songs that you guys wanted to use but then couldn't get the rights to i mean or was it were those songs kind of already very much locked in and no we we played with a lot of songs really? at all moments yeah and they just kept coming back to the ones that seemed to work mm-hmm. you know the opening uh, we had several openings uh you know uh, I, I mean, my favorite one was uh, when we took uh, milkshake <laughs> so you had this female penguin coming out singing milkshake really <laughs> yeah but pharrell you know and it's such a great song and yeah. so and the funniest thing was that you know we loved it and everyone kept saying you can't put that in it, it's too dirty and i would write out the lyrics for them and do a 
do a PowerPoint presentation saying, prove to me where the dirt is in this <laughs> lyric. It's not there. There is no. It's, it's implied. It's yeah. an absolutely brilliant piece of songwriting. It was one of the great song, songwriting, you know, songwriters of the of of, of all time. Is Pharrell. I mean, you know, because it's so. It's in the cracks. Yeah. You don't know why. Yeah. Any of these things happen with his his stuff. He's oh just, yeah, he's, he's amazing. Such a genius. He's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also in Happy Feet, in a lot of your scores, you you love to use choir, and I think it's such a big part of your your repertoire. And and uh, what does using choir? I mean, it's going to different be different from every film. But what what do you see as what does the human voice bring that an other instrument does not bring, and why do you use it? I think one of the reasons I always liked the violin as a kid was it feels like a way of playing the voice. Mm. You know, I always used to like players who who sounded. It's like Perlman. Um, Isaac Stern was really my favourite violinist. Uh, Stefan Grappelli. Mm. It was just used to sound to me like they were singing. Yeah, they really. And when they, yeah. they the vibrations almost feel like yeah. And and the pitch, the the way that the pitch slides to notes or, yeah. or doesn't. You know, and so you have you have an awful lot of control um, over the minutia of the tuning as well. Mm. Um, and. You're getting away from the piano, which is, uh, you know, equal tuning, and and into the real language of music, which is about the complexity of lining up harmonics. Right. So obviously, you it's that's why I didn't like. I would never have been end up, ended up as a violinist because it's too hard to practice on your own. But I, I love playing with other people. Yeah. So, um, so the voices. I think my love of voices came from that, and it's a it's a it's a shorthand. It's a very quick way of getting to a very emotional state for people, I think. I and mean, also there's, I don't know, I find a lot of power in it. Like when you have a lot of voices, you can feel like the, each individual, especially the big chorus, you, I mean, I'll go back to Happy Feet, the, the opening kind of chant, the, <laughs> I mean, that, like the, oh, I mean, like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just, true, yeah. <laughs> you feel that weight and you feel the, I don't know, there's something that you can't get with, like if you did like deep brass or something like that, but. Sure, yes, yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Um, percussion is another thing you use a lot, of course, in your in your mostly your action scores. And I think we talked about it last time a little bit how you kind of discovered your love for it with Drumline. I think was that the yeah. the film that really introduced you to well, to uh, that? it was Peter Gabriel. Two, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabriel two album. I just that was the first album that I remember hearing and thinking, holy, this is amazing. The whole <laughs> world of percussion that I'd yeah. really not realized. Um, and yeah, I mean, Drumline was very specific about about the extraordinarily interesting and uh, funkiness of of the possibilities of mm. what was an unheard of um, to me. I mean, uh, the percussion section in a military band, which is where you know the drum lines come from. Yeah, you know, not noted for their funkiness until yeah. until you get to this point at which um, you know people people are fascinating the way that they can take anything and subvert it. Yeah, and they're not doing it to subvert it; they're actually just doing it because they it leads naturally to that place. And yeah. if you're brought up on James Brown and and you're playing in a drum line, why would you not want to go there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously if you're brought up only on, you know, military tunes, you're not going to go there. Yeah. So it's, a, it's about, it's about different types of music being played by people who don't have the same experience of that, of the history of that particular stem of music. And then, lo and behold, it develops. Mm. This is what all music has always done. And when you use it as a kind of action, uh, kind of a tool for action, uh, do you do you will you find like a rhythm or a beat and kind of then add layers to it, or do you uh, figure out the kind of the melodic, uh, I don't know, the flow of, of of an action piece? And then, how do you structure action around percussion? I guess is with a question. Well, it, it's dangerous because. Um, Stuff like Italian Job or something, or, yeah. or Born even. Born is just, I mean, Born is more minimalism, but it's like doesn't. Yeah, it's just got yeah. a huge. Love. I mean, the, the the thing about it is, is once you set up a rhythm, you you set up people's expectations. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you set up a a pedal, if you set up a, a harmonic sort of a, a monotone harmonic situation, you set up people's expectations. When are you going to change? And why? Um, and it's the same with the rhythms. If you have a rhythm that comes in and it's a strong rhythm, why is it in there? How long will it go? And when will it change? And what am I supposed to feel? Because a rhythm 
both can give you a relax feeling of relaxation because you know mm. it, okay well this is rolling yeah and yeah. nothing to worry about so then you can concern yourself with other things as a as a viewer then there's this other circumstance which is you change it and you if you change it in the right place in the movie you're constantly saying something with hardly changing anything all you do is just changing the rhythm yeah and that people notice and then they attach to that and they know that you're changing things so then now you're messing with people because you're saying, okay, when's the next point I'm going to change? Mm -hmm. Because the next point I w I'm going to change, I've already taught you this last three times that I changed. Now I've taught you that when I change, something significant is going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so you must be very careful about it. And then, and that's where, you know, to go back to an early question, mm -hmm. one of the things is that if the film is changing under you all the time, the edit of the film. That's another thing, yeah. You know, and it's... It's easier to do it with an orchestra with no pulse, yeah, or with a, a much more sort of flowing style. You can just speed up a bit and you get there. You've got grooves going. You cannot speed them up. You have to yeah. be very careful how you speed them up, and you certainly can't slow down unless you want. Again, any changes of tempo mean things because there's nothing else to to latch on for an audience. So I became fascinated by what rhythms does to us and our expectations of it, and I think that's how I try to use it in certainly born right and uh i mean at if i were uh, you know a director and editor i would want you to write a piece of music and then start kind of tightening the bolts of the picture around it has that ever been where you got had the chance to write a piece of music and have the edit kind of fall into place of music or is it always edit changes now i have to change edit changes now i have to change no i mean i think uh you know, for instance, uh, I mean, Chris Rouse, who's just one of the most genius editors ever, really did construct the the London Waterloo scene of um, of was it uh, uh, Ultimatum? Ultimatum, yeah. yeah. He constructed that around basically um, some of the music from um, I think probably number one or two, mm -hmm. um, and it was very interesting watching that because it does look like it's really very constructed yeah <laughs> but it really was the other way around i mean he he really he started with the music in that case and and, and you know and he very elegantly edited it in a way in, in his himself and and it edited the film mm. on top of that so i you know it, it's it's the ideal situation but it's rare yeah. that it happens i know it That's doesn't you, <laughs> you constantly have to just sort of so that, again, the question of investing in a scene, you know, I try and invest and I, I always leave things a little slow to tell you the truth mm. to begin with because I know it's going to get tighter and then we just speed it up and it stays, <laughs> oh, stays <laughs> with it. Um, so, yeah, talk, we're talking about Born. Talk about returning to that to that world. I mean, uh, working with Paul Greengrass again. I know on this one you had a little help with uh, David Buckley, but um, was it uh, did, did Paul's musical... <laughs> Uh, tendencies change at all since the last time or is he the same old good old Paul Greengrass with uh, yeah, being strict to his temp and and <laughs> well yes but the thing about Paul is he understands he un he always understood what people liked about Bourne yeah you know when he walked into the second one he was very honest about you know I like the first film he said I don't really want to change it I'm just going to do my thing with it yeah and it became his really he, he really took it over as yeah. as his he, um, it, it worked perfectly into his kind of sensibilities um, so he very much understood what he needed for for that for Jason Bourne and you know and really we just supplied him with kind of the new variants on things that he needed and uh, it was a it was you know he didn't he never wanted to reinvent the wheel on that yeah, he, yeah. he wanted to bring people back into that world right right from the get-go and was uh, it fun to play around with those old old your old stuff and um, kind of retweak it or was it more it, like it was, it was a sort of a, it was an archaeological dig at times you know <laughs> trying to find everything <laughs> you know some of those weird and wonderful sort of sounds and things i realized they were just kind of me jamming on a bass guitar through a fireworks de uh, through a fireworks effects unit and just recording it i recorded hours of it and then i would go in and cut bits of it up and then make samples of it and uh, so eventually we found the original material and it's like, oh, this is how, you know, <laughs> I did this. It was just very kind of, uh, very experimental in t uh, places. And, you, and, you know, so I appreciated that. Idea. Yeah, I must absolutely. Have done it. So we, uh, last time you mentioned that you kind of, you did take a period where you just really focused on animation. And it was, and you talked about how you had this aversion to the violence in, in film and, and live action movies, you know, per, you know, putting forth these ideas of, you know, oh, you want to get information from someone, you need to torture them, you need to, yeah. stuff like that. So, but you are kind of embracing live action again now. Uh, yeah. So what kind of drew, drew you back? I mean, you did uh, Pan, 
and of course uh, Jason Bourne brought you back, and then now you're doing uh, solo. So, what has kind of brought you back to this world? Um, well, they were the right films, as well, yeah. You know, and there were people I liked working with, and um, and they don't, you know, none of these films really do that kind of everybody beating the shit out of yeah, yeah. for, you know, there's lots of beatings, but they're all <laughs> for different reasons. <laughs> you know, um, they seems to be. It's not. It's not so much about the warrior, uh, sort of the, the the warrior spirit yeah. idea. That that's what I have a real problem with. Mm. You know, with a lot of you know, action films and right. live action films, they they really are always. It's always about who's strongest, who's most violent. Yeah. Um, so coming to let's talk about Solo for a bit. Um, when were you on board with this? Were you before the whole shift with Chris Miller and Phil Lord, or was this? Did you come on board when Ron Howard came on board? Like, when, when were you on board with the project? Um, I originally met with um, Phil and Chris mm -hmm. and, and came on with them. And um, and so it was, you know, it was quite a, a shock. Um, yeah. I, I had no idea. Were there any, like, hints of that happening? Like, Not or, to me, no. But no, everything, I, I mean, I, yeah. I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure. involved in that any, anyway at that point. Um, I just got, you know, this... I got a call from one of the producers uh, who basically said, "Yes, there's been a change, but you're not necessarily fired yet." <laughs> so, and uh, Ron was so gracious; he he came on board, and we had a dinner, and and uh, and I think he spoke to Hans and said, "Well, you know." So and Hans uh -huh. said, "I think you'll be right." So, <laughs> so it was it was it was it was very it was very good to know that uh, you know I wasn't. Um, I wasn't, I'd been, so in a way I got kind of hired by two sets of directors, yeah. which is, so that was okay. But I think the essential thing was that, you know, I think um, Kathy uh, Kennedy was was uh, was confident and, uh, and Alison Sherma, who unfortunately we've lost now, yeah. you know, sadly, who I've known for years, she was the executive on Bourne. Oh, wow. She yeah. was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It was, it was a terrible, terrible thing that happened there. Um, but so it just carried on, and um, Ron went into shooting, and then and then eventually um, he came out of shooting, and we started. So you 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 hadn't started writing anything at that point, or any ideas or stuff with Phil um, and Chris. The, the only things I started with Phil and Chris were some of the source music things mm. that we needed to do, and right. I'd gone through a few iterations, and one of them does end up in the uh, one scene didn't get you uh, got cut, but uh, one of them we used. Uh, in the, in the movie, which hopefully will make make people laugh, I think I'm not sure. <laughs> so you, for this one, you did get to have a um, an original theme by John Williams. Yes. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Talk about had, had you met John before? And not really. No, very briefly at one little thing. Um, oh, no, I mean yeah. that was the, the first call I got with you know with Chris and, and Phil was uh, the idea is that John will write a theme. Mm -hmm. And somebody will take that theme and you know do the rest of the work, as it were. Um, are you okay with that? And for me, that was what do you mean, okay with that. That's the perfect situation. <laughs> so I, I was really, I was much more excited in a way about getting to sort of have at least some yeah. interaction with John. Yeah. And which I did in the end. I mean, he was incredibly wonderful and very humble. And yeah. and he kept saying to me, you know, you don't really need me. You, know, you don't need me, you can write your own tunes. I said, well, that's very kind of you to say, but I think we do. And my first role in this movie is to make sure that we have the best music we can. Yeah. So I'd be crazy not to say, no, no we need yeah. you. Say no to so, John Williams. Yeah. Yeah. So, so eventually, you know, so he wrote he wrote a, a tune. Um, he kind of did a suite and a few, a few cues throughout the movie at, at that time. Um, and we demoed them. And they were... Fantastic, and, mm. and then we were really off to the races, and uh, and I've taken all of that material, and it's everywhere. I mean, it's running, and I mean, it'll be interesting to see if people can really sort of pick apart <laughs> <laughs> what's what. And I mean, he's done tunes, but also orchestrations that I have used, and then I've used his tunes, and I've done other things with them, and I've added things to them, and I've used them in different ways, perhaps, and he... He would have thought of. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, he was very generous, um, and one of the things he told me as well is, you know, don't don't feel so, you know, honourable that you must constantly honour this sort of 
the history of the of the music. He's, you know, he was very he was very gracious in saying, you know, don't forget it was just a gig for me as yeah. well. <laughs> you know, so so just do with it what you need to do. And he was he was very excited to hear. He said, I'm very excited. You said, you're so good with ch with uh, sounds and things. He said, I'm very excited to hear what you'll do with it. <laughs> so it kind of gave me the, the sort of confidence that yeah. I, it was okay to, you know, to, to move things into a realm that, you know, isn't, isn't very Star Wars at times. But yeah. it is, at times, it's not a Star Wars film. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a real heist film. And there's no, you know, it's not a film about the Force. Right. So the force in it really is love, and the complexities of love. And there's good, there's dark sides to love, and there's you know, bright sides to love. And there's and there's love that's friendship, and there's love that's lust, mm -hmm. and there's greed in love. And so all those things I think are explored. And so we needed, you know, we needed themes to do lots of other things. Yeah. Uh, but we got from John. We got some. We got the core material. So, did, was John kind of the overarching team uh, theme? And that did you write? Was there a specific theme for solo that did you write, or was John's theme? No, jo John wrote a theme very much what I call is a hero tune for mm -hmm. him, and and a, a B part which was I call sort of the the longing mm. of Han, the searching, and I uh, used that in all sorts of different ways, including right in the opening titles as well. And I uh, I did some slightly crazy things to it, but it's. It is essentially exactly what I think I felt the very first time I heard John play on the piano, mm. which is um, somebody who's searching for a family, who's searching for love, who's searching for something. Um, and so those two themes are really kind of they 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 are the you know they're everywhere, and um, and then I needed a theme that would that would tell the audience that there was that Han had a an image of love, and that was different from what he really what love would really come to mean for mm. him and then i needed a, a theme for a gang you yeah know, and a gang in the sense of also being a family mm -hmm. and i needed a theme for freedom uh and that worked well with one of the characters and i needed a free another th sort of another type of theme that was about friendship and three freedom uh not so much literal the freedom and uh and then I needed a, a, a tune that, or a motif that would at least always represent the secrets mm. that we keep from each other. Um, so everywhere, and then and then you have kind of bad guys. Yeah. You know, you the marauders <laughs> appear. So I needed I needed a very exotic theme for them, and and something that would always we could always help tell the story with that would would pop right into your brain every time you heard that. So there was all these kind of other themes that I did need to to help the storytelling and. And uh, they all needed, but they all needed to surround correctly and be integrated with elegantly the, you know, these kind of the pillars that John had established 40 years ago mm. in stylistically, in, in gravitas, in seriousness in the yeah. music, but also in drama, in, in the fun as well. Yeah. You know? And there's a couple of times we took literal sections of his old films, uh, which I did for very specific reasons, because uh, it's, it's a thing I call reminiscence therapy, mm. which is about, this is a film that we all know where it's going. Yeah. Um, and reminiscence therapy is kind of a medical term for looking back, uh, helping patients want to move forward by looking back at your life. Mm. So it was a personal thing as well, to, to look back at my life and look at how much John had influenced me, really. And I, oh, even nice. if I did know, I didn't know. You suddenly, as I started to study his scores from, from all the, yeah. really studied them, we got, I got all of the material, and it was fascinating, his sketches, and how much I have been nicking from him <laughs> over the years. That's and then not realizing it, I thought I was nicking from somewhere else, or I thought I was inventing it, but no, most of it's all nick from him, you know. <laughs> and so all of the fetishes that I've already established in my own writing you know you can sort of find a lot of them we really go back to John so I think the score should hope and you know I'm talking here before anybody's heard it exactly so this, no one's heard it no one's seen it once you've all heard it you might be like he is talking utter bullshit <laughs> but um, well this is what I my, my pure heart is hoping for yeah but, you know who knows what it what people will think of it I tried to do it 
honourably, but also allow it to move forward. And the filmmakers wanted the, the you know, the music to move into a not forward, different, just into a different, yeah, it's different not lane. Part of the, the main yeah. the thing. It's it a side it's story. Only, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, and speaking of criticism, how do you how do you handle criticism? And I'm not talking about like from a director or producer, but yeah, the world. Like, do you positive versus negative? Does it affect you? Does it affect the way like oh, like oh that fuck when they don't know what they're talking about or like oh no they, so, they very don't. often they do. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's, <laughs> it's madness to think that people you know what, you know there's criticism. There should be criticism. You should take criticism about foreign policy very carefully. Um, with criticism about music, you have to take the understanding that people get from music what they what they need, mm. and so if they don't like your music, it see it says that either you're just not speaking to that particular person. But if you get enough people saying that, it probably means you're not speaking to enough people, mm. at least. And so what you think you're saying might not be what you are saying, and there may be reasons that you haven't explored. Um, so. I take criticism as badly as anybody does yeah. because it's heart-wrenching because oh, you yeah. think you've tried. Um, but then I think it's important to just stand back and go, well, okay, whatever I thought I was doing, I may not have been doing. And yeah. I need to think about that. You know, How can I fix that in the future? Do I want to be more universal about what I'm writing? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it does come down to, though, what the film needs. And, you know, so people who hated... Born Identity when it came out because it was very minimalistic. You know, I I would say at the time it, it was painful to see people say this. You know, this is rubbish. Um, and in in comparison with some scores, it definitely was not. It didn't work the same way. So I, I understand. Yeah. Um, but I was trying to get something for the film that was unique and did what the film needed. So and it even if you do it for films that don't work and the music doesn't work, you know, like, I think that. The idea is to try and find something unique for each film. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see on this one, on, <laughs> on sort of what's happened. I mean, I was trying as hard as I could on Ferdinand, you know. And, I know, you think um, everyone has, to, everyone's doing their best work. I don't, no one's trying, I always tell no one's trying to fuck stuff up. No one's trying to do their worst job. Like, no, sure. <laughs> so, I mean, it's but it's, true. it's, uh, and also it's just, it's also opinions too. So many people have different opinions, different tastes, and it's, um, uh, and people's tastes evolve. My taste evolves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it always is always changing. So, talking... so keep that criticism coming in. <laughs> It'll be very useful for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in the future now, I mean, coming up, uh, you have had a Training Dragon three. You're returning with yeah. joining up with Dean again, and yeah. and this will be the final, the end of the trilogy. I think. Right? Is that what the idea was? Is to do a trilogy? Yes. I think so. Yeah, I think he. But I get into trouble when I say anything about this. He keeps, you know. So I remember him. Dean, I know Dean published that. Like he wants to do a trilogy. Okay. So it's, it's, whatever, <laughs> whatever Dean says is yes. Is, is um, what he says. And uh, and that's that's coming up pretty quick. You're gonna have to finish. Yeah, sometime in the next towards the end of the the year, right? Yes. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, by I think we're pretty done by about Thanksgiving. Wow. I saw you had a, a countdown clock out there. <laughs> the oh yeah, this is, this is Batu, my assistant. His uh, his idea of a joke. We we started it on solo. The <laughs> countdown to basically it was a days, hours, minutes, and seconds to the d to the point at which I needed to get in the car to go to London. In other words, you cannot write past this point. So yeah. when it gets to zero, and so we did it. It was very effective. I mean, when you've got sixty days, you think, oh, you know, I can take the weekend off. Yeah. You know, when it starts to get to forty, and you're looking at two hours of music, you're thinking, I. I need to get on with this. <laughs> and then when it's in 14 days, it's two weeks to the minute sort of that I've got to get in the car. So it was very effective. Yeah. So we finished this one. It got to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I went down into the kitchen the other day and he'd started it again for this. I know, it's like 172 one. days. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So that was very very cruel uh, so. <laughs> but also in the future um i mean you have a you have a concert in june i think uh, hollywood and uh hamburger hamburg, yes, and yeah, um in hamburg and then i'm at the malaga film malaga festival uh on the 4th and the 7th of july yeah so and uh talk about do you see yourself doing more not just film music concerts but also other standalone concerts and concert pieces like that i know that you've talked about writing away from film yes is that sort of the the game plan for the next uh five, ten years or something yes, like that? Yes, I mean, very much is to write. I mean, 
the concerts are hard for me because I'm not a performer. I'm yeah. not very good at performing. So um, these will just be a bit of fun to do mm -hmm. and people ask you to do them. That's very nice of them to ask that. We're doing another performance of the Prussian Requiem in Spain. Um, so one of those days, the fourth, is, is classical pieces by oh, me wow. and probably maybe even somebody else. And then the seventh is film music. Mm -hmm. uh, and then even on the 10th of August in Lima, Peru, wow. we'll be doing the... Um, Prussian Requiem there again with uh, with Jose Sabria who's the conductor of the, the, rec the recording and um, and those are fun to do but I think the writing of it I realized that I really need to write I'm just I I know how to write for the studio <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna write and record all these things every year I'll try and do an album of stuff and this will be the first one that comes out in the so yeah we have a, C a CD 15th. coming out right yeah 15th of June I think so it's called hubris hubris oh, which perfect. is about <laughs> me and and the guy who started the first world war yeah <laughs> and uh so let's just to, to wrap things up i'll do some one of those fun uh stuck on a deserted island you know if you're stuck on a deserted island for the rest of your life here are your choices if you could only bring one kind of food for the rest of your life what would you pick uh, hmm. well i'm i'm so I'm so alcohol. <laughs> well, that's the second question. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So food to sustain yourself for food each sustain, the rest well, of your life. But that's the thing is, would it sustain myself? The food you like to eat and it wouldn't necessarily sustain yourself. Well, you could catch fish there. I mean, you could sustain other ways. Vegetarians so oh. don't eat fish, you know. <laughs> so um, it'd be hard. Maybe um, I think uh, Swedish fish. Swedish fish. There you go. <laughs> The rest of your life, perfect. Uh, alcoholic beverage, what would you bring? Um, mm. <laughs> One drink for the rest of your question. life. It'd probably be champagne. Champagne? Yeah. But good, very, very dry champagne. Yes. <laughs> None of that. Sweet. Monk. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, favorite movie to watch for the rest of your life? Um, babe. Babe? Yeah. <laughs> TV show? TV show? Um, West Wing. West Wing, good one. <laughs> Yeah. One piece of furniture. A bed, a chair, a table. A bed. A bed? Just a really comfortable bed. Yeah. <laughs> and one artist musical body of work. Oh. So one artist. One artist. Whole composer. whole body. Composer, musician, mm. singer, songwriter to oh, listen to for the rest of your life. Hard. <laughs> very hard. I mean I I have you know, it could be the first four albums of Ricky D. Jones, <laughs> or pretty much anything by Ralph Vaughan Williams, uh, or almost everything by Debussy, or um, or anything, or you know, or Prince. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, that's a very hard one. Yeah, okay. I'd probably have to say Vaughan Williams then. It'd okay. probably be more material to <laughs> to go through. So. <laughs> well, John, thank you so much for your time John. again. It's always great to, to chat with you. Pleasure. So. <laughs> okay, bye.